We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We've come. We've come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding, Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you entered into the house of the Lord, come and receive His holy word. If you are a guest, be blessed. Interceding Christian Center has a God-given desire to minister to the total person at whatever level they may be and to labor with them to bring them into full spiritual maturity. Restoration of the fellowship is our primary focus. We first strive to seek the lost, persuading them to accept Jesus. Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. 
Amen. Let us pray. And Father, we bless and glorify your name for being God all by yourself, Lord God. We're praying right now, Lord God, as we delve into your word, Lord God, that the storehouse of knowledge be open to me, Lord God, that I'll be able to minister and that the ears of the people be attuned to your word, Lord God. Open up their hearts to receive your word, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we bless and we glorify you for what it is that you've already done, Lord God, for the healing, for your release of power in this place today, Father God. We magnify you, oh God, hallelujah. You are good and worthy to be praised. Bless right now. Use me as you see fit, Father God, for your work. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Bless God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Elder Jones, I, I often say, I often say this. You guys don't believe I have childhood friends or I had childhood friends that I always have my nose stuck in a book or something, but I actually have a childhood friend who's sitting in the back back there. Amen. Michael Bingham. Michael still looking, yeah, yeah, they, they know the name, amen. Still looking like he's 21, man, you need to stop it. Amen. To God be the glory, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. On this morning, I want to go back to basics. I want to go back to basics. Can I go back to basics? I, I want to dare back into basics. I want to look at some things here. The scriptures found in these books are part of the Roman roadmap to salvation. And, and they come from chapter 5, and it jumps from chapter 5 to chapter 6. See, oftentimes we miss part of it because we will not go beyond chapter 5. Uh, we will not go beyond the last part of chapter 5, and we don't go over to chapter 6, where Paul continues to talk about what it is that he has started in chapter 5. Right. Amen. Chapter 6 is a continuation of explanation of being justified by faith to share in the grace. To share in the grace. But we seem to have forgotten as a church today or we are actively involved in not appreciating the gift of grace that God has given us. We seem to have forgotten in society today we tend to, to oversimplify things. We seem to simplify everything to the point that it loses its value. We seem to do it. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. We get confused between between tradition and commandments. Can I get an amen there or an ouch? Amen. Hallelujah. We seem to get confused between traditions and commandments and we don't want to be caught up in tradition, but there are certain things that we do not want. There are commandments that we do not need to devalue to the point of being tradition. Hallelujah. I was talking to someone the other day. I was talking to my friend, Apostle Tony Wilson, matter of fact. And he said, you know, my dad and I, you know, we, dad said, my dad, because his dad's an apostle, he said, well, the thing is that, that, that we, we don't do communion on first Sunday and, and stuff like that. And I was thinking about that. He said, yeah, because we don't even wear the collar and stuff like that on first Sunday. I'm like, hey, man, to God be the glory. Have absolutely no problem with that. But see, the problem in the church is that we want to get beyond just not wearing a collar. And we want to forget the commandment, which was to take and eat the bread and drink of the wall. Come on now, somebody. Somebody need to hear what I'm saying. Somebody is going to be blessed by by this true word on today. But it's, it's, it's funny, it's, it's human nature that, that we, that we, that once the mystery is known, the appeal is lessened. The appeal is lessened. We, we, we know the mystery, so therefore we don't, not appealing the mystery. We, we don't want to, to, to adhere to the mystery anymore. Or we don't want to give the mystery any credence that we used to give it anymore. As the appeal is gone, as the appeal for the things of God is gone, a contemptuous view replaces what was once adoration. What once carried mystic is now common. This is so true in human to human interactions, and the same is true in human to God interactions, human to divine interactions. Once we think we know God at a certain level, we seem to get so overly comfortable with what God is going to do, thinking that God My God, my God. And this is so, especially when we talk about the grace of God. 
That's the most important attribute of God, amen? Because it's his grace that allowed him to command his love toward us when we were yet in sin. It was because of his grace. Right. Huh? It was because of his grace. Far too many people take his grace for granted, and what they do is they cheapen the grace of God. Uh -huh. They cheapen the grace of God. So on this morning, I want to open up your understanding and also warn you not to take God's grace for granted in a sermon titled Cheap Grace. Cheap grace. Cheap grace. Hallelujah. We tend to forget the depth of God, his width, his height. We tend to forget the, the immeasurable nature of God Almighty, and we take his grace for granted. Oh, how we treat the things of God with contempt, with a sense of just common. And God commanded us in Leviticus 19.30, he spoke to Israel, said, observe my Sabbath and reverence for my sanctuary. He says to have this because I am the Lord. As a pastor, I often talk about how it used to be back in the day, how we a generation ago had a reverence for the sanctuary. Not just the outside of the church, but we showed reverence for the inside of the church. We showed reverence for the pulpit of the church. We showed reverence for the pews of the church. We showed reverence even for the musical instruments of the church. Not worshiping those things, but we know those things were set aside to worship God. So therefore, we showed reverence for those things. We would not go around and abuse and misuse those things. But nowadays, it seems like that time is gone. There was even a time when the people of God were respected. Amen. People would not just misuse you and abuse you because they knew that you were tied into the higher source. Yes. They knew that God had your back. So therefore, they were afraid to treat you just any kind of way. Yes. There was a time when we wouldn't even throw beer bottles on the church ground. And Lord knows I picked up a case two weeks ago. Huh? We wouldn't even throw cigarette butts on the church ground, but Lord knows I picked up a twit six pack or whatever they call those things, a pack or two, car, yeah, that's the word. But nowadays the church is treated with such contempt that on, not only will they rob you in the parking lot, they'll come into the sanctuary in the middle of a service and rob yes, you. Yes. They'll hold you up because they have so much contempt for the church. They, they have so much contempt. What was once unthinkable has been replaced by a mentality of devaluing or cheaply viewing the things of God and even to the point of cheaply viewing God himself. Amen. We don't value the grace that God has given us. The thing about his grace is his grace is more than sufficient. Brother Paul, bear witness to that. It's more than sufficient. But his grace is not ignorant. It's not ignorant. I was watching a video the other day. It was supposed to be a praise dance on this video. But the praise dance was gyrating, butterflying, and cabbage patching and everything else. They were doing everything. They were dropping it like it was very hot. They were doing everything that they could in order to the value. Oh, my God. And it's heart rendering that in the body of Christ today, we have people who are so ignorant to the grace of God that they flood their liberties. My God, my God. Hallelujah. There's, there's something, there's some things that are simply beyond inappropriate in the church. Amen. But there are some things that are downright abomination that yeah. even the worst of people know is wrong. Amen. Hallelujah. But we have come to a point where as we cheapen, we have cheapened our, our walk with Christ in such a way we have ruined our testimony. We have ruined our witness. We have lost our witness so much before the world because we're flooding our liberties and we're trying so hard to look like the world instead of the peculiar people that God Almighty has made us. We are supposed to be different from the world. To understand the definition of the term cheap grace, the full term, the full phrase cheap grace, let's look at the word cheap first. Cheap is an adjective that describes the value of the noun or the pronoun. It precedes something, it precedes something, it describes it. Something costs not as much as you expected it to do. 
the cost wasn't extracted as much as you thought that it was going to cost you. When something that is cheap, it costs very little or nothing and is or was less expensive than you expected to pay. Thus, something that came cheap is not as valuable as something that cost a high price. Now that we've defined cheap, let's look at grace. Something that's not cheap. Grace is unmerited favor. Favor to accept, which allows one to ask for forgiveness. If it was not for God's grace, you would not even have the inclination one day to say, Lord, I surrender. If it wasn't for the grace of God, hallelujah, you wouldn't dare do some of the things that you do in the house of the Lord or even at home because you know that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and he sees and knows all. The grace of God is it's abundant, it's abundant, it's abundant. And God has shown his love toward us through all mankind in all ages. That grace is what we stand on and grace allowed the shedding of blood before forgiveness was even sought. So it's not hard to understand that his grace is amazing. It's not hard to understand when the, when the songwriter, the captain, wrote this song saying, Amazing grace, hallelujah, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now see. It's not hard to understand where he was coming from, from being a, tra a captain on a slave ship to being a saint of the Most High God. It's not hard to understand that he appreciated the grace of God and he understood how God could remove the stain of sin from your life. It took amazing grace to bring myself to the cross. Amen. And it took even more to bring some of you to the cross. Amen. huh? But as amazing as that grace is, stretching as it is indicated in Romans 5, to cover a multitude of sins which occurred before the coming of Christ and your sin before repentance and even heartfelt repentance after you initially were born again. It's amazing that this grace is there. As amazing as this grace is, it is not supposed to be abounding to the point of you flaunting the grace, abusing the grace. Abusing the grace. Oh Hallelujah. Before the outbreak of World War II in 1936-37 or somewhere around there, when the Nazi party was taken over, a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran priest who did not believe in what the Nazis were doing, abusing the Jews. And he wrote a book called Discipleship. In that book, Bonhoeffer defined the term cheap grace as the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. He defined it as baptism without church discipline. He defined it as communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. You try to separate Christ from the cross. Grace without Jesus the Christ. The emphasis is to attempt to separate Christ from the grace. Reaping the benefits without doing uh -huh. Yeah, I've, I've come down the aisle and said, Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as soon as I walk out of here, I'm going to get my beer bottle, my wine bottle. I'm going out there and I'm going to fornicate and do everything that I think I'm big and bad enough to do. But I'm covered. I punched my ticket. I asked for forgiveness once. Oh. The emphasis is to attempt to separate Christ from the grace. This type of thinking promotes carnal Christianity. Yes. Huh? Carnal Christianity. The idea of carnality or carnality. Or she is saved. And I know stories in the Bible where the demons bow down and say, You are Christ. Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 yes. oh my yes. God, my God. Yes. They think because they made a profession in Christ once that they are saved, even if there's no striving for obedience to the commands of Jesus to live a life separated, holy, and set apart. Yes. It is the ideal that we can have Jesus as Savior, but not necessarily as Lord. Yeah. Oh, my God. People who advocate for carnal Christianity 
or free grace as they called it, acknowledge that it was God's grace and not their works that allowed salvation. And they do not deny the necessity of work living holy for sanctification. But they distinguish the call for salvation from the call to sanctification. They seem to think that once I'm saved, that's all I got to do. I don't have to work toward the sanctification process. Listen, I understand, I understand. In this world that we're in today, I tell you, I know that worship music, worship is the originator of music, and that music was taken from the church and corrupted by the world. I also know that though we must bring these things back to the church, we need to know that the corruption must not return to it. Huh? Did you ever, anybody ever notice the way the temple was set up? They had the outer court. They had the lavier, which was the place where they washed their hands at. They had the holy place. Then they had the holies of holies place. Don't you realize why it was set up that world that way? Because we were in the world. We were of the world. But God wanted us to come in and be cleansed at that place and go from level to level until we reach the place where we can grab a hold to the mercy seat of God Almighty. I mean, I, I tell you, I've been in places, and I know musicians, y'all y'all know that y'all can back me up, the singers and musicians can back me up. I've been in places where all of a sudden the musician will play a riff of Jungle Fever in there. All right. oh, look, I'm saved, but I do remember. Huh? They'll play a riff of, of, of Shake What You Got Baby in the, in the middle of worship music. They will play things that you know are an abomination. Huh? See, the thing is not the music, it's just the, the, the thing, the ideal that that music is portraying does not need to be dragged back up into the church in an attempt to make holy what is unholy. Yeah. Right. Right. My God. There are some things that are not reverencing the things of God. Ezekiel 22, the Lord speaks to Israel and he said, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. And I am profane among them. The priests of Israel, the chosen Levites, were not valuing the things of God. And since they didn't value the things of God, they were not teaching other people to value the things of God. Oh my God. You cannot take the things of God lightly when the word tells you clearly to teach your children my Sabbath. Teach your children that I am a holy God. I am a righteous God. Teach your children not to be bouncing off the pews, standing in chairs and all kinds of wild things while in the house of God. The priest didn't teach the flocks anything. They didn't teach them to value the things of God. They didn't teach them that things that were set apart for holy were set apart for holiness, not for unholy actions. In other words, the people of God were not being particular or peculiar. Too many, too many of us are using the grace as a license to sin. Amen. I'm going to let that soak in like a good saturation for a barbecue. Brother Ray, and I'm going to let it saturate in just and let it marinate a little bit. Amen. In other words, the, the, in other words, people say that the attitude is okay. I'm going to do this because he will forgive me. I'm going to do this because I know I'm going to ask for forgiveness later. Huh? Whatever happened to the fact that you must have sincerity in order for the grace to be abounding? Yes, yes sir. A man once said, he said that, I love to sin. God loves to forgive. What a wonderful arrangement. My I saw a sign the other day on the Church of Christ over here on Missouri that said, sin would not be so attractive if its wages were instant. If you were paid back by God on a weekly basis, you were paid back by God on a bi-weekly basis, or you went to the mailbox on the first of the month and you got a check for your sin. Could you imagine getting a W-2 for your sins? Or have a 1040 
But in essence, you have both the W-2 and the 1040 because the glory, glory of God, the, the recording angels are writing it down anyway. Huh? And one day you're going to be audited. Huh? One day he's going to call all these things into account. And he's going to ask you, why did you trample on my grace? You barely, you thought you had slipped in, but depart from it, for I know you're not. You played with me. You thought you was playing, but I'm not a fool. You cannot mock me. Don't you know who I am? Go on, goat. When you are dead to sin, then you are alive in Christ. Oh, yes. When you are dead, that sounds good to our Lord, have mercy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Then you are alive in Christ. When you are dead to sin, this is when you begin to live alive in Christ. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. I was reading a book the other day on discipleship. And the author titled his work, Why Churches Don't Make Disciples. Oh, my. One thing that stood out to me was that in a list, he said the church has inadequate goals. Oh, my. He pointed out that the Great Commission has twin goals, and they are to teach and disciple. Uh -huh. They are to convert and disciple. Right. You don't believe it, reread Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says that. Though that was significant, what he said right there, what really stood out as applicable to the cheaping of grace in one of the areas is what he called one of, called one of the effective approaches to discipling. He titled his paragraph, Sin Management versus Lordship. Oh that is knowing that you are sinning, but reducing the amount of sin, but not eliminating that sin that you are fully aware of. Mm. Knowing that you are in sin, but not getting rid of the sin, Amen. saying, I just won't sip as much as I used to. Uh, come on, pal. I won't tip as much as I used to. Huh? I, I used to go to the club at least twice a month, but I'm just going to cut it back to once a month. <laughs> Even though I used to sleep around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, I'm just going to cut it down to Tom. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My God. Oh my God. Not eliminating the sin. Sin management is like tithing 3% instead of 10. Oh. As if you brokered the covenant. As if you were wounded for your own sins. As if you were bruised for your own iniquities. As if the chastisement of your own peace was upon you. As if your blood was, blood was shed. As if you received 39 strikes. Help us, Pastor. Help us. How about shady old shot? See, sin management does not allow Jesus to be Lord at all. All meaning every aspect of your life. For Christ I live, for Christ I die. This is what God, and this is what he means by having a sold out life. It means that every thought that comes across your mind, you bring it into the subjection of Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross. Every thought that comes across your mind, you look it up and see, is this appealing to God? Is this going to edify my walk in Christ? Yes. My God, my God. Sin management, sin management. Huh? My God. Sin management. Now I'm not growing in grace, but I'm reducing my flood of that grace. Come on. The Pharisee at the wall was speaking about the tax collector. He looked down at him and he's like, as bad as I've been, Lord, I thank you that I ain't as bad as that clown down there. He tore up from the floor up and drew all the way through. That's sin management. That's sin management. That's, that's evaluating your own sin and comparing yourself to someone else. As bad as I am, instead of comparing yourself to the immeasurable grace of God. That's sin management. Hallelujah. Somebody says sin management. Sin management. This man, this man, this, this Pharisee wasn't seeking. Jesus to be Lord of his life. He just wanted to reduce his sin print. Let it be known that God is not to be mocked. God sees.
see if you're trying to do sin management. God knows if you are doing what he has called you to do or if you're trying to play him to the curb. Come on now. Huh? God knows when you are striving in and when you are just reducing or managing the sin in your life. Yes. Parceling out just how much sin you are involved in while expecting the full measure of grace. <laughs> grace is not to allow you to keep sinning and doing it. I'm getting ready to close, believe it or not. It is not meant for you to be able to flaunt your liberties before people. Matter of fact, there are some things that you ought to just take the strike for and say, I just won't do it. Even though I know that it is not a sin, I'm going to just take the strike and just won't do it because I don't want to cause nobody to fall. Grace isn't to allow you to keep sinning at will, but it's to allow you a zone of understanding or fertile ground so that you can do what? Grow in grace. Grace draws you in and allows you to grow. Grace is like the broth for the soup called discipleship. As I said earlier, consider this. It is not by chance that this started, this sermon started in Romans chapter 5 verse 18 and and rolled over to Romans 6. It wasn't by chance, for if you only read the verses in chapter 5, you would think that grace was cheap. Grace was cheap, as Paul was explaining that God forgives sin from the lowest regard to the most heinous. God's grace expands to cover. So no one can come and say, well, Lord, I know you ain't going to forgive me for this. No, his grace expands to cover. See, as tenacious as sin is, as tenacious as sin was, that by the sin of one man, Adam, the world was corrupted by the sacrifice and the grace of one man called Jesus, the Christ was all sin forgiven. Hallelujah. Mankind is redeemed because of that grace that he shed on a sinner's cross on Galgutta one Friday evening when he went down. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. But if you only read the last of chapter 5 and not flip the page, mm -hmm. then you would not know that sin should not rule in your body. Yes. Huh? And you would understand that you are dead to sin, for when you accepted Jesus and his grace, you also accepted the journey that you were supposed to go on from convert to disciple. Come on. When you flip over to chapter 6, you understand the price paid for you was not a cheap price. It wasn't easy, but he said it was worth it. Oh, my God. It makes you, makes you just get a little more understanding of why the angel said in Psalm 6, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou would come and down and visit him? It would make you understand the grace and how costly it was. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. oh, my, 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 my. You understand that the cost, the cost you pay is your striving. Mm -hmm. You're growing. Yes. Grace is and never was cheap. Grace didn't cost you nothing but confession out of your mouth. Huh? You were not beaten. You're not forced. And here in America, we just have the worst outlook about it anyway. I mean, in places in Africa, people are dying so that they can call Jesus Lord. They are dying so that they can worship Jesus. And droves and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Africans are walking into the water, renouncing Islam. They're renouncing, they're claiming Jesus as their Lord and Savior over there. But over here where we got it so easy, Grace is not cheap. Turn to your neighbor and tell him grace isn't cheap. Grace ain't cheap. Grace ain't cheap. Turn to your other neighbor and tell him grace isn't cheap. Grace ain't cheap. Grace ain't cheap. See, I, I know this is a bitter word for some folks. It's okay. It's a bitter pill. It's a bitter pill to those who want to mix carnality into the mix. It's a bitter pill. It's a very bitter pill for some people to swallow. It is a bitter pill. I, I understand that. I do understand that. 
those, and it's a bitter field for those who want to use one scripture to justify their being right, carnal. Right, right. One scripture, and then they're like, well, it said that I can do such and such. Oh. You've got to understand the whole truth. You've got to understand what it means to exegesis or exegesis of scripture. You've got to understand what it means. Grace was not cheap, so stop flaunting the grace of God. They often use Romans 8 and 1 saying, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but they forget to say, who walk at all. Somebody help me finish that. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do what? What you say? So you mean to tell me I cannot flaunt the grace of God? You mean to tell me that I cannot just do what I want to do when I want to do? They often use that. It's so true. Because all of the sin you really have done before accepting the Lord, all that had condemned you has been forgiven. But all you do from that point onward, you must ask for forgiveness of. The Bible says, for there's no good thing in the flesh. Huh? See, the call to salvation is more than just asking for forgiveness once. Oh, yeah. But the call to salvation is a call to repentance, and it's a call to holy living. Grace is free. It's free. It's free to us. The cost was paid one day 2,000 years ago, approximately 2015, 16 years ago. The cost was paid on a hill far away. A place called a skull, a place called Golgotha, a place where the sins of all mankind were paid by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A place where when he was lifted up, all sin was drawn unto him. And when all sin was drawn unto him, it was such a heinous sight that God Almighty closed his eyes because Jesus said himself, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God wasn't going to look upon a sin that was on his son who was being tortured for us. Oh my God, my God. With every lash leading to the cross, a sickness was healed. Huh? You got a sickness, go on, take that lash. With every lash leading to the cross, sickness was healed. With one lash, diabetes was healed. With one lash, HIV was healed. With one lash, oh my God, hallelujah, cancer was healed. With one lash, oh shit, get a whole shot. Hallelujah. With every lash, with every wound, the blood of our iniquity was taken off of you and put on him. Yeah. When he was lifted from the cross, he sent grace. He forgave those who even put him there. Can you imagine? He said, look down and said, oh, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They were being used for a purpose, but... While in the midst of his pain, he had enough compassion, enough awareness of what he was doing, of his purpose. That he looked down and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hallelujah. In the same token, he's standing making, hallelujah, intercession for you saying, Father, forgive them for they know not they do. And each and every time that you cry and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, he shows his nails scarred hands and said, Father, forgive them, I paid the price. Yes, hallelujah. Oh, uh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace is the opportunity to be forgiven and to live in glory that was afforded us. Stand on your feet, John. Hallelujah. 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 Grace wasn't cheap. The grace that we so easily flaunt. I, 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 I often say this and it's so true. That's why I'm going to say it because I'm going to say it until everybody get it and then I'm going to say it again. When you're cheating even on your income taxes, you, you flaunt the grace. My God. Hmm? I'm going to write this owl off for Fido. He's one of my children. 
You're flooding the grace of God. You're flooding. Huh. Every time, every time that you you take it upon yourself to say that, yeah, he gonna marry me or she gonna marry, I'm gonna marry her or whatever, and then you commit adultery or fornication with that person, you are taking the grace of God for granted. You are cheapening his grace. You're making his grace worth nothing. You are crucifying him again on the cross. You are saying, Jesus, get back up on the cross because you didn't die enough for me. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God and my King. Hallelujah. His grace wasn't cheap. His grace wasn't cheap. He did it for me. His grace wasn't cheap. His grace wasn't cheap. His grace wasn't cheap. But he did it for me. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's awesome. By your name. Lord God, we pray that this word got into someone's heart and they understand, Lord God, the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And they would not take this for granted, Father God. They would not cheapen the grace of Christ. But their hearts and minds, Lord God, will be stayed upon doing the right thing, Father God. That their witness not be tarnished by living and flung their liberties. Now we bless you, we glorify your name. For your grace, oh Father, we bless you and glorify your name for your mercy, your goodness, your kindness. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Glory, Lord. His grace was achieved. He did for me. Flood the altar, everybody. Flood the altar, everybody. Just flood the altar, hallelujah. Because we, we got some repentance. We got to put some things back into perspective, hallelujah. No matter if you were the Pope, you have done something to flood the grace of God. Now it's a time for you to come forward and repent right now, hallelujah. Everybody, flood the altar, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory.
touch your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you. <laughs>